Welcome to another episode of Talking Fast, a Gilmore Girls podcast. I'm Suzanne. And I'm Alexis. And we're two longtime fans of the show, excited to rewatch and recap it along the way. This week we are covering season two, episode nine, Run Away Little Boy. The bio for this one is when Rory and her classmate Tristan are cast as Romeo and Juliet in a school play. A jealous dean insists on attending every rehearsal. Oh, I remembered this one. <laughs> yeah. This episode is just full of so many, like, tropes, mm-hmm. I think. <laughs> like, Romeo and Juliet and jealousy. Yeah. I groaned when I saw this. I pulled up <laughs> Netflix and it was this one. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I like I like the episode. I think it's pretty entertaining, but it is like also a bit. Cringy. I agree. I agree. <laughs> we'll have a lot to discuss. <laughs> yeah. Should we attempt to recap it quickly? And I am McPantameter. No. <laughs> oh God! Please no. <laughs> uh, I've done so much work with Shakespeare and stuff, and I can never like I don't know. It just doesn't compute. I just yeah. don't, <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. hear it. I don't <laughs> Agreed. Know. I'm just always in a, what is it, free verse, right? When he breaks out. out yeah. Of, yeah, that's us. <laughs> okay. I, who's going first again? You, Me. You. All right. <laughs> Here goes nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Three, two, one, go. So the big thing this episode is that Rory is stuck with Par- Paris, Madeline, and Louise. And surprise, surprise, Tristan to do a Shakespeare scene. And, of course, this makes Dean very jealous, but Roy doesn't tell him at first, which makes it even worse. Um, We also get a little bit of romance between Lane and Henry, which is nice. Um, On the other side, Lorelai is being pressured into dating again um, because it's been too long. She dates a 22-year-old guy, and everybody teases her about it. (laughs) Okay, that was good enough. (laughs) Okay, are you ready yeah for your turn let's go (laughs) okay ready go we've got another convenient group project for this episode of television starring the regulars plus brad this time they're doing shakespeare they have to interpret it they go traditional kind of boring but they want an a uh meanwhile lorelei is dating again the guy is really funny and young everybody in town makes fun of her for this but she's starting to move on Dean and Tristan are having a peeing contest the whole episode. Eventually, Tristan is going away to uh, military school. Good riddance. Goodbye. <laughs> nice. I like that description of what was happening with them. Mm-hmm. I think I got a bit colorful, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> it was accurate. That's what matters. All right. <laughs> Let's slow down. Get into our analysis. No Jess in this episode, sadly. And I feel like that was a mm-hmm. such a missed opportunity, not only for our young sass attack segment, but mostly for <laughs> the fact that a Jess and Tristan interaction, I think would have been iconic. And like Dean, only all of Dean, all that Dean can do is like yell and glare and whatnot. But Jess could have like cut Tristan to his core with a like well-placed comment, you know? And I wish we could have had mm-hmm. that. <laughs> Yeah, that would have been great. Like, if Jess had come upon, I don't know, Dean and Tristan in the store or something, or and, like, added his two cents. <laughs> it wouldn't have been hard. Like, there's been worse plot, like, worse forced plot points before, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I did give somebody my Jess ass attack this episode. Oh, nice. But we'll get there. <laughs> Vicariously <laughs> through someone else. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I actually have my Rory's bookshelf in this cold open here also. I think I'm kind of front loaded for this episode. I'm back loaded, so that's perfect. um, (laughs) Yes. But we start off with Lorelai bursting the door with some videos. I guess she's been to the video store to rent something for them to watch. And her options were The Shining and Bringing a Baby. (laughs) And so I chose The Shining as my Rory's bookshelf for this episode. There were some other options throughout the episode, but they were also Shakespearean that I wanted to pick this one because The Shining is one of my favorite movies. I've taught it before in a class with, with like, 
an emphasis on how the environment changes your mental state, which was pretty That's fun. That's so cool. Um, and it's one of, it has some of my most used uh, GIFs for texting and stuff. Um, so that's all I had to say about The Shining. I'm glad that Lorelai picked it. In the end, it was kind of a, at the end of this scene, it was um, a way for her to express her anger at <laughs> Rory and Suki kind of turning against her in this scene. Yeah. That's the movie where they're at like a hotel, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, with the, did we talk about that before with the guy yeah. with that like classic face that they yeah, mentioned? Jack okay. Nicholson. I'm yeah. pretty sure I have chosen The Shining as Rory's bookshelf before now that I mm-hmm. think about it. I'm just no, predictable that way. <laughs> that's good. And you mentioned that this movie is a way for ch- Lorelai to channel her kind of anger at Rory and Suki. And for context, the premise of this opening scene is that they have sort of banded together to tell Lorelai that there is this late wedding present that has arrived. It is a reminder about the Max Medina breakup, of course, and a lot of this episode is Lorelai grappling with this present, this memory, and attempting to move on from their breakup. It is an ice cream maker. It is pretty beautiful. They joke that it's fascist because it has an Italian name. (laughs) (laughs) And the scene ends with this funny line from Suki saying that, um, I bet Max would have let us keep it, which is kind of funny because Lorelai is like dead set on returning this ice cream maker at this point in the episode. I have a theory about who this is from. Who? So after um, the Harvard episode... Emily teases that she's going to have to return Lorelai's gift. And I'm not saying this was necessarily her original gift, but I think it would be very in line with Emily's um, character to send this to Lorelai um, late just because she knows that it'll... It's kind of a way to troll Lorelai. Like, maybe she doesn't necessarily know how Lorelai will react and how, like, kind of downcast she'll be but it just seems like an emily type of move to send this and not say anything about it i like that theory oh that's good (laughs) i hope it's true okay moving forward in our episode we have we seem to have a new english teacher but we have the same material that it seems like shakespeare's the Mm -hmm. only thing that you learn about at chilton and this time they're in a Shakespeare class even like what (laughs) yeah and it's not the only one there's the third period Shakespeare class as well right wow yeah there's only so much you can so much you can do with Shakespeare I mean you could read every single play I guess that would take Mm -hmm. a while but why why would you do that I don't know yeah I did like that the teacher wanted them to experience Shakespeare rather than just reading him. I thought that was Mm -hmm. a good twist on things. Yeah, I liked this assignment, actually. Um, The whole, like, each group gets an act and they're responsible for putting a performance of it together. And I liked the open interpretation option as well. Like, Mm -hmm. you could, we see by the end of the episode the different approaches each group takes. I think is fun, especially for a young a young group of students they get to put their spin on something that might feel so like old and far removed to them so I thought it was clever the fact that it's worth 50% of their like entire grade yet again not that would not be my (laughs) pedagogical approach but (laughs) yeah what is she grading on is she grading on their interpretation or their acting skills because it's not fair to grade their acting skills. I know. We should we should see the grading rubric. We got to know what the mm-hmm. <laughs> how she's going to be grading this. Yeah. As we possibly could have expected, <laughs> Rory is paired with Paris, Madeline and Louise and somebody from the third period Shakespeare class who we'll meet later. Mhm. They leave the scene. Paris I thought it was kind of like She wasn't fighting it like we might have seen her in the past. She kind of just accepted it. Um, But after they leave the classroom, Paris, of course, wants everybody to go and have a meeting so they can strategize. (laughs) But first, Rory is um, 
met by Henry, who we haven't seen for quite a while. And we get kind of a cryptic conversation about time, like times for a phone call. Um, Henry admits that Paris is a little bit frightening with her vigor to get everybody into a meeting. Um, and so we're kind of left hanging with that. Yeah. And I'm excited to see Henry again. I wish we got a lot more of him. Me too. Then Rory joins the meeting with Paris, Madeline, and Louise. And Paris, of course, is negotiating all the times for rehearsal and everything. Right. Like, did we miss when they picked her to be the director? Or is that just assumed? Like, of course she is. But the teacher did say, like, you should nominate a director. Yeah. I think it was just understood by Paris and nobody fought it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But we also get a view of Tristan, who is back. We haven't seen him for a long time either. Hmm. And they start talking about his suspension. And... So this is where I give Louise the Jess sass attack because (laughs) she is talking about these two guys that Tristan is hanging out with and how they're getting into trouble and everything. And then she says in her kind of deadpan voice, like, they're even starting to dress the same, (laughs) which I thought was hilarious because they are dressed the exact same. They're all in school uniforms. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I thought this was a great just like, yeah, sassy moment. That also isn't some something that you laugh at necessarily the first time. It's maybe something you laugh at like five minutes later when you realize like, yeah, they're all wearing the same thing. Yeah. So. <laughs> I like I like that they're maybe getting more personality than before mm-hmm. and beyond just the boy crazy character. And we see like that they get to have moments of humor and whatnot too. I really I like them. <laughs> I wish I wish that we got more of their friendship, like, with Rory, yeah. without the kind of intensity of Paris. Not that I don't want Paris to be there, but I also want to see, like, bonding between Rory and Louise and Madeline. Yeah. Because Paris is pretty outspoken. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will return to this whole appearance of Tristan momentarily. Of course, you know, it couldn't be that he would just be in the episode and then not be in their group project, right? But (laughs) more on that momentarily. Uh, We, you know, Rory, after school, arrives back home and finds Lorelai making phone calls to various Gilmore family members, trying to track down uh, whoever sent her this ice cream machine. Someone on the other end of the phone is lecturing her about wedlock. Lorelai's like, you don't hear that one much anymore, which is really funny. Um, and, you know, Rory kind of after observing this does question Lorelai, like, do you think you're going too far trying to find the person who sent this? Like, you've tried your best. Why don't you just kind of accept that you have the ice cream machine? You know, she's a bit worried about her. And Lorelai says that she'd like closure. Um, so I think we'll see this will be explored a bit more. Her sort of like manic search to return the ice cream machine is not just about etiquettes of gift giving I think clearly (laughs) uh yeah surprise surprise I also have my Lorelai's closet in this scene for Lorelai's sweater actually Mm. um it's like a two-toned dark green and then lighter green shirt and the lighter green is like this kind of western style blocking across the shoulders you know how like some western shirts have um like another layer of fabric that goes over the shoulders and then kind of comes down into a triangle over the chest a bit <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know my dad wears shirts like that all the time but they okay, okay and for his shirts they're like vents for you know when you're out in the desert and stuff and need some air mm. flow I don't know if that's how they are for most people but Okay. For well, hers, I'll try to get. A, I'll try to get a visual aid of this on TikTok. If anyone else listening can't picture this like Thanks. me right now, <laughs> but I know it was good. I know. I just forget. I can't remember it right now. <laughs> it's hard to describe. It's like because it's like it's not lapels. I don't know. Mm. It's sometimes people have like suede patches over their shoulders or something. Maybe as protective. I don't know. Anyways, yeah, we'll figure it out. But it was a nice sweater. I like the two-tone green because green's one of my favorite colors. 
and it looked good as usual so and on the note of fashion rory also mentions to lorelei in this scene that they have decided to hire her to make costumes for their group project which we'll get a bit more about later uh but (laughs) <laughs> and Roy says Paris already would like to have a concept meeting with Lorelai <laughs> at three tomorrow. Like classic Paris. Paris also wants Rory to do 24 takes for a screen test, which is, you know, she's like full speed ahead at this whole director thing, which is funny. It's amusing to me. Yeah, it's endearing. I'm sure mm-hmm. to actually be on the receiving end of it might be a little bit <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, we get the follow-up about the Henry and Rory discussion of meeting at 8 o'clock as well. Uh, After Lorelai is done using the phone, of course, Rory calls, well, no, Henry calls Rory, then Rory calls Lane, and then Rory puts Lane and Henry on together. So it's a really roundabout way to get away with having Lane talk to a boy underneath Mrs. Kim's nose. (laughs) And they get five minutes only, but it seems like this is something that has happened before, that they've been in communication, and that they are having a good time talking to each other. And it's pretty cute. Yeah, I wish that they could have an actual relationship, but Mm -hmm. it is great just to see them liking each other. (laughs) And just to be reminded of three-way calls is something as well. (laughs) And after this, Lorelai... Heads off to her business class, which um, she was taking a business class in the first season, but we didn't hear much about it except when she was meeting Max Medina at the cafe. But -hmm. we've heard about it a few more times this season so far, so it seems to be building towards something. (laughs) But she goes and she gets there and we see this young guy who's pretty good looking, kind of typical looking come up and talk to her about the vending machine burrito which seems like such a questionable choice to me right (laughs) which apparently she gets every week he goes off into this whole spiel about a conspiracy theory related to machines and whatnot which is really (laughs) just an excuse obviously to be talking to Lorelai at this point in time (laughs) Mm -hmm. and they have sort of a back and forth he asks her for her notes And he does this every week, it seems like. So, I don't know. I feel wishy-washy about this guy at Mm -hmm. this point in time because it's like, it's fairly good chatter. I think he is fairly cute as well. He's got good hair, which is important, I think. But also the fact that he asks her for notes every week, I'm not that attracted to someone, Mm -hmm. you know, who isn't. Like, you're choosing to be in an extra degree and, like, you're not even doing your own work. A little shady, but... yeah. Um, he does ask her out and she's pretty like unsure, a little resistant about that. So she's not sure if she has the time and he accepts that pretty easily and is like, well, here's my card. So I liked that he wasn't too pushy about it. Just like, well, the offer's there. If you do ever decide you want to go out and knowing how this storyline goes, I think it's, I think it's so funny. The joke is that he's young later on, but I'm like, he has a card and he's wearing like a, like a tweed jacket or something like that they really do make him seem like older than he is at this point in time (laughs) yeah he looks like at this point maybe in his late mid to late 20s yeah (laughs) following day most likely the group continues to meet to discuss their shakespeare performance um, we discover Paris wants to go classic with a traditional Elizabethan per approach. And we see Brad has joined them from third period Shakespeare. So we think like, oh, this is the only person joining them for a second. And he is like nervous and anxious and shy and like what we know of Brad. He's like, a, I like him as a recurring character who is mm-hmm. just like poor, poor guy just tortured by Paris. <laughs> yeah. I chose Paris's choice to go with an Elizabethan theme as my Friday night dinner critique for the episode. There are many others in this episode that I could have gone with. So this one's kind of trivial, but Mm -hmm. I picked it because I wanted to talk about it. So I think that this show, if I was grading this and I had given students free reign for open interpretation 
I would say that this shows a lack of creativity. And I know Paris is saying that she, that it's a, a traditional scene, like um, the most classic scene of the play or something, but that's ridiculous. This entire play is obviously a classic. Like you can't just make that excuse because you can't think of something better. So I would grade down for that. And I have some op- options of ways that they could liven it up a little bit, maybe throw some mm-hmm. different interpretations in there. First off, if you really want to be in line with the Gilmore Girls plots, <laughs> you could have the uh, Montagues and Capulets be Yale versus Harvard. So <laughs> then you have everybody in Yale or Harvard regalia. And that would be the death scene would be like at some, I don't know, sports game between Yale and Harvard. <laughs> Football, probably. Yeah. <laughs> and it could be like the tailgating or something that we see in future episodes. <laughs> or they could take uh, an approach kind of in line with the um, everywhere or everything, everywhere, all at once movie that has just come out. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's great. Um, where there are all sorts of kind of alternate universes depending on any tiny choice that's made. And so there are all sorts of like weird some universes like there's one universe where everybody has hot dogs for fingers and stuff like that (laughs) and every other universe is just something like slightly different the people are all still there and more or less themselves but with different circumstances because of their different choices and so I feel like they could have done something like that kind of thrown a curveball in or and they f- they do this at the very end, but they could have mixed up the super gendered casting for the show and brought some kind of critical lens into it. Um, I think that just would have been more interesting than going traditional. And I'm disappointed in Paris for doing this because she thinks it'll get her a higher grade. I wouldn't right. give it a higher grade if it was me. I I agree. I wish she would have thought outside the box a little bit and perhaps their accidental gender swap at the end is what saved their grade. You know, like the the teacher <laughs> yeah. will think that was their plan all along. So they might have been a little saved by Tristan bailing on them at the end there. But um I agree with you. I was real I was disappointed in that choice. Yeah. As much as I love Paris's like go get it attitude Mm -hmm. I do think she has a lot to learn with um working in groups (laughs) yes totally she could have gotten probably some really cool ideas from the others I I bet like Madeline and Louise would have had I don't know some Spice Girls versus boys uh Backstreet Mm -hmm. Boys type of thing or something like that like rival pop groups or something that could have been fun and speaking of going for a classic, uh, we see Tristan arrive, tells them that he's part of their group, that all the other groups had his ex-girlfriends, so he couldn't be in those groups. He has to be in this one, he says, while looking like directly at Rory, clearly the actual reason he picked their group. And Paris says, like, in response to this, that their group doesn't have any of his ex-girlfriends in it. She's like, so we're being punished for our good judgment, which I thought was really funny. Um, But ultimately, they kind of go with the classic, like, you are the epitome of Romeo or whatever. You have to be Romeo. And Rory has to be Juliet. Uh, Paris does say to Rory that she's got that waif thing down, which is another (laughs) really funny line. But um, ultimately... It's almost like just roll your eyes a bit like on the nose of like, well, of course, Tristan's back. Of course, it's for Romeo and Juliet. Of course, Rory's going to have to play opposite him. Like you mentioned tropes earlier, and this is about as full of tropes as it gets. (laughs) Yeah, it's almost like they just wanted to have a scene with Rory in a little like princess type outfit between in a love triangle type situation. (laughs) Absolutely. I don't think we're that far off. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. But we'll continue to unpack this sort of like tropey storyline as it is really the main focus of the episode. 
Uh, but before that, we pick up back with Lorelai at the inn talking with like Suki about this whole ice cream machine fiasco. And yeah, we also get a nice little scene of Michelle refusing to eat more more than 12 blueberries. Um, but the the main thing is that Lorelai wants to kind of pawn the ice cream maker off on Suki at the inn um, because she hasn't been successful in finding who sent it to her. Suki, of course, like they can't use it. It's like a single serve type thing. Like you could make enough ice cream for a family in it, but not for an entire inn. So obviously mm-hmm. she doesn't need it. Um, and she kind of confronts Lorelai about like why is this such a big thing for her um has she gone on any dates since she broke up with max has she even been thinking about it which she says that lorelei's had her grieving time but if they broke up at the end of summer and it's just like maybe october now that's really not for an engagement i think lorelei is right that it was like she needs a bit more time but yeah i think it's been only eight weeks about because at the open of the episode, Suki goes off on this thing about how Martha Stewart oh, yeah. says if your present is 10 weeks late, they don't have to return it. But Roy corrects her and says eight weeks, implying like, <laughs> yeah, implying that it has actually been eight weeks. And I was like, wow, is that true? That would have been like two months. <laughs> I don't think that actually is accurate because I did glance at the next episode and we're full on in winter <laughs> with the Bracebridge dinner, which is exciting. Oh, Side note. Yeah, I know. But um, the timeline yet again, I can't, I can't fault them for it too much. Like it's just a TV, it's a good TV show. But I was like, okay, I think it's simultaneous. I think there's, I think it actually is that more time has passed, but they're acting like less time but also acting like that less time is more. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. I'm getting a bit convoluted here, but basically I'm with you on the whole, like, I don't know if she's really had that much mourning time over such a serious relationship. Mm -hmm. Once Mm -hmm. again, we have these timeline critiques. They should have, (laughs) they should have hired us when we were mere preteens and toddlers (laughs) (laughs) to help with Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, Lorelai, kind of admits I thought that this was really astute of her that she admits that she is nervous about like the implications of dating right now like um is it if it's too soon and Suki mentions that it could be like a pre-transition guy which I think is Mm -hmm. really what kind of sells Lorelai on this because she doesn't feel like it's time for a transition guy yet and that it would be, yeah, too soon for that. But a pre-transition guy is even less serious than a potential transition guy. So really, she just kind of needs somebody to tell her it's okay to go out with somebody and have no, like, game plan for it, really. Like, just go out with somebody to get a bit of mojo back or something and, like, get back into practice with it and see how it goes. But you don't need to have any, like desire to even before the date like you don't need to have any ideas of dating this person for a long period of time you know yeah I thought it was a pretty good bit of advice from Suki here of course like I do think you don't have to be dating to be moving on Mm -hmm. either (laughs) um and I know of course I know you would agree with me there (laughs) but um uh But I do like that, especially because later on we do see that Lorelai is really cheered up by this date. And we do, I do think Lorelai is obviously someone who enjoys like getting dressed up, going out, socializing, getting to talk to someone a lot and like Mm -hmm. having them like admire her and whatnot. So I think in the end it does show that Suki knew what Lorelai needed and needed a bit of motivation Um, to view dating in like a healthy way for where she's at currently so yet again the best friend there is (laughs) I did want to go back to what you had mentioned about the 12 blueberries like thing at the start of the scene it's like it starts with Suki giving Michelle these like low fat low cal pancakes that have all these blueberries in them and yet he says he can't eat them because they have he can only have 12 blueberries and Suki tries to like get him to eat them 
uh, without counting them. And she says, like, I'll give them to you if you swear on, like, Destiny's Child. And he, like, storms off because he's not willing to do that. And this is, like, yet another representation of Michelle's disordered eating. Mm -hmm. And I just feel I have mixed feelings about this because I one part of me is, like, I feel like they're making light of it. And I don't really find it to be that funny. It's just not healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, But the other part of me is like, are they putting forward their own critique of the fact that some people sadly view eating this way? And it's not like, I'm not blaming people for having disordered eating, obviously. But um, like, because they're showing that he's kind of ridiculous, like this is ridiculous, that he'd only allow himself 12 blueberries. Like, that's the joke. I don't really know. I... I hope that makes sense. But this is just like not a new thing that they've done. We've pointed it out before, but it's like it's funny and they have good chemistry, Sookie and Michelle do, but it's also sad to me, of course. Like, I don't know, mixed feelings about it. Yeah, I agree. I was just thinking like the different portrayals of eating in this whole show are like so polar opposite. There's not a single character who like we see eating often who eats in just like a normal moderate kind of way like it's either all the food groups yeah whatever yeah it's either michelle being really particular and like um counting calories and stuff yeah yeah or it's lorelei and rory who eat junk food all the time at like unknown quantities and it seems to have no effect on them Mm -hmm. There isn't really much of a, I mean, we do see other characters eating, but they're, it's not made a big deal of, it's not like a focal point like these two are. So it's such a, such a weird, I don't know, it kind of, I feel like it's kind of um, representative of Americans' views on eating Mm -hmm. and because we are a culture that's like so obsessed with dieting and stuff like that and yeah. like always knowing exactly what you're eating or punishing yourself for eating something or I, I, yeah it's a really interesting critique in a way but also <laughs> buying into it at the same time <laughs> yeah yeah or speaking of like cultural views of eating like oh how fun and quirky that Lorelai and Rory get to eat all they want all constantly junk food and whatnot because they're still small bodies Mm -hmm. you know and like hot attractive skinny people like can post like a TikTok about eating like a bunch of hamburgers and people are like oh what fun and then if a larger person does the same thing it's viewed completely differently Mm -hmm. and just the the double standard of that is I feel like something that's more acknowledged now than it was then. So just to think about it, it takes me out a little bit of the show occasionally when I just see them taking on the ideas of eating really in the show. And I agree, like there's just no, there's no like casual, normal kind of like, like what are Luke and like Suki eating or something Mm -hmm. like just the people who like regular stuff probably. Yeah. (laughs) Or Lane, like I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, the only food we get from Lane is her complaints about her mom's, like, super strict diet stuff as well. <laughs> like, yeah, they that's only a good point, eat, actually. like, tofu stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that as we continue. Yeah, that was a good thing to bring up. Poor Michelle. He should just be able to eat blueberry pancakes or, like... One of the gifts it's, of the earth. <laughs> it's fruit. Fruit yeah. is good for you. <laughs> it's true. Um, Fiber, antioxidants, they're tasty. Sugar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the next scene is later that day, it appears. Um, this is kind of like after the work day and school day in between. Uh, later on, Lorelai will be going on her date and Rory will be going to her play practice the crux of this at this moment is that Paris calls to inform Rory that too many other groups are performing at Chilton. They're going to spy on their performance, which is, you know, going by the book. So I'm not sure what they would be, what kind of intel they get, but whatever. Um, and Paris has found MissPatty.net <laughs> and booked it for the rehearsal space. So they will be rehearsing in Stars Hollow. And naturally, this causes some 
this puts Rory in an awkward position. Mm-hmm. I love Miss Patty dot net. I don't mm-hmm. I don't think any websites anymore really are dot net domains. Yeah, and my closed caption spelled it as like Miss and then Dash Patty, <laughs> which just makes me laugh as well. Yeah. <laughs> and that it's just Classic. like her name in the URL, not like studio or anything like that. <laughs> I love thinking about her, like, who do you think she got to help her make that website? Because there's no way she did it on her own. Like, maybe Kirk helped her. (laughs) I can just imagine, I bet it has uh, an image of her dance studio with the barn doors open and her, like, ballerinas dancing in there. And then a close-up image of her smiling. Yeah, like a headshot. It's, like, (laughs) red just red background with blue block font (laughs) with her like no links or anything just like no call this number kind of thing Mm -hmm. Uh, but anyway anyways we interrupt this episode with a message from our sponsor are you an aspiring student director with a need for a rehearsal space look no further than miss patty's Located conveniently near Hartford and Stars Hollow, a cute town that will make you think of Mystic Pizza. This rentable space is perfect for your theater and performance group project needs. While your fellow classmates might have lackluster acting chops, and they may not share your commitment and passion for performance, Miss Patty's rehearsal space is reliable and sure to help you prepare on your path to success whether that is winning directing awards or getting an A on a group assignment that's worth 50% of your grade. Go to misspatty.net to reserve Miss Patty's today. All you need to do is sign up for an available time slot and you're set. Just be aware that you might have to be a bit patient for your opening. Miss Patty tends to run a bit late because you can't rush cool downs after one of her many different dance classes. For listeners of Talking Fast, you can expect a fantastic deal. Use code TALKINGFAST at checkout to get 10% off your first booking, and you'll also receive a complimentary dance class of your choice from Miss Patty. You don't want to miss out on this deal. Lorelai attempts to help help Rory. I thought this was kind of strange because Rory wants to tell Dean what happened at that party. She wants to tell Dean that she kissed Tristan, which I think she should do. In case, like, Dean and Tristan run into each other while he's there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is kind of complicated because they were broken up at the time, but I think he still deserves to know, especially because we know Tristan and he's probably going to bring it up. (laughs) What is it? Yeah. What is it about TV shows loving the, like, we were on a break uh, conflict? (laughs) Obviously with Friends being, like, making that phrase popular, but then... Later on, Rory herself will find Mm -hmm. this situation with Logan and her later on. I actually just saw a funny TikTok of people like doing the monologue that um, Paris does when she opens the door and Logan wants to talk to Rory, you know, and she's like, you're a two bit, et cetera, et cetera. Really funny. But um, yeah, like we're going to see this conflict show up again. And the question of do you tell, you know, Rory's mishonesty, according to Lorelai and I was curious, like, where you fell on this and it's on the question of should she tell him or not? And it seems like you think, yeah, like, Rhett, like, just tell him. Yeah, I, well, I think to give him preparation for Tristan. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, it is kind of, it's kind of unnecessary information for their relationship overall. Like, she wasn't cheating on him. She cried afterwards, like, it wasn't (laughs) because she actually had just liked Tristan this whole time, you know? And, but, especially because, as Roy was correct to suspect, Tristan will very likely confront Dean and, like, lord it over him. So I think, yeah, he needs to know just to be prepared. I agree. I was, like, leaning toward her not having to tell him, um... Especially, like, I liked how Lorelai mentioned this is the kind of um, honesty that would only make you, Rory, feel better uh, because you feel guilty about it. It's not actually, like you said, not going to really affect their relationship in any way, and he'd be fine not knowing. But 
I think I lean toward yes for what you described. Like, there's no way in hell that Tristan is not going to try to, like, share this information with Dean. And it's, so it's going to be better coming from her than from him. Interestingly, though, by the end of the episode, like, even though he Tristan did drop heavy hints, it doesn't seem like Dean ever did yeah. find out. So it's like, oh, interesting. But, I yeah. mean, he tried. So I think our point stands like, yeah, it's probably the strategic move to tell him. Mm-hmm. I did like Lorelai's Lorelai role plays with Rory to go over the conversation and I loved her interpretation of Dean and mm-hmm. his hair trouble. Um yeah. this side's cool, this side's voice. not so cool. <laughs> yeah. And like the low intelligence, like she's like barely speaking in full sentences while she's doing it. I think it matched with how we see Dean sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. not he's not dumb. He's just not as interesting as Jess. <laughs> yeah. I want to, yeah, I I was thinking about this the other day. I don't want to go off on a diatribe, so I'll try to keep it short. But in terms of, like, not a defense of Dean as a person, but in defense of, like, his characterization compared to the other boyfriends, I feel like he kind of got the short stick in terms of, like, there's nothing, like, largely appealing about him and then he just gets worse and worse like the only traits he has and only storylines he gets are like his jealousy and just becoming more of like a negative person in her life versus like Jess and Logan with their own faults also have these like other appealing sides of them and they both get like character growth Mm -hmm. in storylines and things that Dean just just doesn't get at all like no wonder we don't like him like the writers yeah. didn't treat him the same as the other two. And perhaps that just speaks to Rory's like, as she gets older, there's just more complex relationships and people in her life. I'm not really sure, but like. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like they forgot to fill out a full character sheet for him with like likes and yeah. dislikes. And mm-hmm. so they'll just insert things depending on what's best for the episode. But like, you don't get any overarching hobbies or interests or anything like that. Which is what makes us connect with people. Yeah, totally. I think on the, on Gilmer guys, I think they call that like the deeming of a character is when the writers like make a character just like more stupid or like less interesting for like convenience of the plot. And so sometimes they'll be like, this is like the deeming of (laughs) either Dean or like another character where they're like, oh, the writers are kind of just foregoing that character for convenience, which is pretty funny. Poor Dean, I guess. He could have <laughs> <Maybe>. been. <laughs> if they had just done a true crossover from Supernatural and Gilmore Girls, then maybe he would have been a bit more interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so we show up at Miss Patty's, who is leading a guided meditation, telling her her um, students to breathe in, and she takes the big drag for a cigarette. And then breathe out, <laughs> and she blows it out, and it's just so, like, uh, ironic. Yeah. Um, but Paris is waiting outside, and she comes up to talk to Miss Patty, very angry because Miss Patty's group should have been out of there four minutes before so that Paris could use the stu- the space that she had uh, reserved from Miss Patty. Miss Patty stands up to her pretty well. I thought it was kind of funny telling mm-hmm. <laughs> telling Paris to chill out most pretty much. Um, We don't actually get a scene of the rehearsal, which I thought was interesting, because right away we go to Dosi's Market, where where Dean is working, stocking shelves as usual, and he's kneeling down, and Tristan walks up and does a really obnoxious, like, oh, story boy type of, (laughs) like, call out to Dean. He was just so rude. And he pretty much just trolls Dean for the entire scene. I know. Like, at first, throughout this whole scene, um, part of why, like, I groaned when I saw it was this episode is I just remember how, like, jealous um, Dean is and how annoying it is to me. But at this point in this, this episode, before anything else happens, I was kind of on Dean's side momentarily because I'm like, Tristan is such an asshole And I hate Tristan so much that I kind of imagine if I was in Dean's shoes, I'm not a very physical person, but maybe I'd want to start a fight too, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And he's calling him like stock boy. 
and he purposely like drops flour on the ground so it breaks creating work for him and then he drops money on the ground which is another like power play that is just so gross and like Dean ends up having to walk around the block to cool down and I'm like same honestly (laughs) um and I just I'm like I kind of get I get it of course Tristan has entered there to purposely like ruffle him up in this way and he falls into it so easily it's like just have control you know like don't let him get the better of you but and that's essentially what Rory says when she comes in to break up this altercation she's like um, she just has to explain it to Dean outside. She says, like, I didn't ask for him to be in the group. I didn't find out until later. Um, so, and Dean, like, calms down and says, you don't have anything to be sorry for. And he seems to trust her in this moment, which I'm cool with. And then that's when it ends, because later on we'll find out that he doesn't actually trust her in this way. So, For this scene only, I kind of got where Dean was coming from, mostly because I'm with him on Tristan just being the absolute worst. (laughs) Yeah, I was even proud of him for how he, like, chilled out at the end of the scene Mm -hmm. and trusted Rory, as as you said, for now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And, like, kind of, yeah, calmed down and brushed it off because, yeah, Tristan was just being such a pompous asshole with no other goal in life except for to be a pompous asshole. And yet somehow Uh, Rory still feels like she needs to be nice to him, which baffles me. (laughs) I know. We'll talk about that more later. (laughs) God. (laughs) So we, as I said, we don't get to see the rehearsal, which would have, I'm imagining would have been very tense. (laughs) (laughs) But we show up back at Luke's and... Rory is sitting there eating and Lorelai comes back from her date. Um, she got very small portions, so so of course she's hungry. And she really kind of talks about how, like, the date didn't go well. They had nothing in common. They ran out of things to talk about before the salad came. But she is she feels like it was a good move anyways because she has her confidence back. She kind of likes that she was able to get dressed up and go and kind of be wooed by somebody and it felt good to just get back out there so Suki was right she knows Mm -hmm. her friend well (laughs) (laughs) yeah and as they talk about how she is now a casual dater um, Luke overhears this and has a very pointed look uh, that we will follow up more on (laughs) Um, and the other major thing in this short scene is that Dean comes in after his work shift and it turns out he was not trusting Rory at all or maybe as he worked he had like time to think it over and just started to like obsess over this or something like that but he decides that he'd like to attend all of her rehearsals which is just I can't even begin to describe how inappropriate that is the lack of trust the overbearingness of this like protective jealousy is so gross so pushy she says no he disregards that and is like no i'm gonna come and like no 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 thank you (laughs) yeah it's it's not even it's a school project why would he think that he who goes to a different school can attend it Mm -hmm. it's also not like rory is alone with tristan at any point he also knows that he that Dean knows that being there is going to throw Tristan off. So he's really just going to basically ruin the entire thing because mm-hmm. he wants to make Tristan uncomfortable. And he yeah, he doesn't trust Rory. So Rory is going to be uncomfortable. Paris is going to be pissed. <laughs> like yeah. it's just, yeah, completely unacceptable. It's yeah. And it's just a hallmark of an unhealthy relationship. Like, to restrict your freedom of, like, going about your life and doing things is so not okay, you Mm -hmm. know? Like, this is one thing, but what would the next thing be, you know? Like, first it's, like, you can't go with a group project if there's a cute guy there, and then what? Like, you can't operate that way in a relationship. It's just not – it's not – it's uh, it's uncalled for. (laughs) Yeah, he has to – he has to trust her and – I don't know. I feel like this is really one of the beginning of the ends for Mm -hmm. their relationship. It obviously still goes on for a while, but... For too long. Yeah. But, like, the rest of their relationship is really 
tumultuous because of trust. And if Mm -hmm. Dean had just at this point trusted Rory and everything that she told him outside of the market, then it would have gone completely different. That's a good point to mark this as a sort of the beginning of the end. I think you're very right about this. And it's a bit ironic that later on, perhaps he has reasons that he shouldn't be trusting Rory, Mm -hmm. you know, but in this moment, he really should be. And yet he does it. And that's just going to set into motion a lot of other things for them. Yeah. And it like as he leaves, Lorelai looks at Rory and says, oh, he's totally not fine. And Mm -hmm. Rory looks scared. And that's another thing. Like if if you leave a conversation and you're the person you were talking with looks legitimately scared about you of you, that's not a good sign. Like now she has to think about everything she does because it might set Dean off. It might be like the turning point. And that's just not a good way to go on. Yeah, agreed. Moving forward, we get a follow-up about Lorelai's dating journey as well the next day when they're all at Luke's yet again, you know, have dinner there, have breakfast there, every meal. (laughs) Uh, And this scene contains my Stars Hollow moment. Um, Basically what happens, they're all, you know, going about breakfast as usual and who walks into Luke's but Paul, the guy that Lorelai went on a date with, and his parents. And Paul's looking a lot younger, let's just say. He's like looking kind of like a guy who just graduated, like a frat guy who just is no longer in a frat, but you know he was. He's got like a South Park t shirt on, like a ball cap. He looks so much younger. His parents are there, and he's like so enthusiastic when he sees Lorelai. He's like, oh, um, you know, you were talking so much about this town, about Luke's, like, I just had to come. I had to bring my parents. It's so funny. Everyone, like, Luke is just there. And um, his, like, the guy's dad says, darn shame about Rachel. Like, to Luke, it's like they've been watching the show, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And they eventually leave, and everyone just begins this running joke of judging Lorelai for dating such a young guy. And Rory, I have, um, I love her moment here where she says, I've always wanted a little brother. <laughs> like, <laughs> she's being really funny again, like we noticed in the other episode. And uh, I was just like dying throughout this. And a lot of other characters will get a lot of other jokes in at Lorelai's expense, making it <laughs> seem like he was a lot younger than he actually was. And I just think it's so fun. And it's that the community is so well knit that they can all laugh about this at Lorelai and the also but also the thing that attracted Paul to this diner at all was how well Lorelai described Stars Hollow and he was just so it was so appealing to him he wanted to come witness and experience it himself with his parents yeah I love this scene and at the end Luke tells two kids who are sitting next to Lorelai to move down a couple seats just so that he'll have some peace of mind. I know. He says, I don't know what her cutoff is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I don't remember if it was before or after this scene, but sometime within this day, we get a confrontation of Rory and Tristan. So I don't, I don't really know why she thought she could reason with Tristan, but she wants him to promise her that he won't tell Dean that they kissed at that party and I I really just don't understand why I I feel like Rory's connection with Tristan is just that she thinks he needs her like she could be a good influence on her on him so she needs to be that for him because he's like he's not treating her well he's being an absolute dick to her at this moment and she keeps like She'll get ma- mad at him for a little bit, but then she keeps, like, asking him how he's doing and trying to, like, help him with his friendships and stuff. It This whole scene just made me so angry. <laughs> I agree. Um, it's like, oh, I yeah, because she's like, it seems like you have a lot going on. You're getting in trouble a lot. You're getting caught getting in trouble. There must be something going on. And 
we'll come back to this later on so I don't want to talk too much more about it but yeah she's like digging for something that explains his bad behavior when it's like it's really just bad behavior and it's not I yeah I just like the fact that she like tolerates him and keeps coming like back to like I just don't like I don't like it and I think your description of like feeling like she he needs her or that she can be the influence to turn him into like a good guy is definitely part of their like dynamic here Mm -hmm. she also there was one moment where I felt like at the beginning it seemed like Tristan was just kind of poking fun at her and then he becomes really malevolent I thought when she says that their kiss didn't mean anything to her um Mm -hmm. and it was a mistake and you can see in his face just like shift and you know he's not gonna let it lie god he's such an asshole (laughs) i know because part like we we talked a lot about how he a lot of it was like this hunt or game to him Mm -hmm. and she's the object and perhaps he felt like he was successful after they kissed even if like she didn't want to date him after that and then to hear like from her perspective it was like nothing to her whereas I'm sure it was probably a lot it meant a lot to him he of course doesn't want to admit that he has like feelings or anything like that um and then he just goes like full evil kind of Mm -hmm. in response to that like you're describing and I think that leads us to the like following scene where they begin to rehearse and it becomes so clear that this whole conversation where she got him to agree to not say anything was like moot point because he is perhaps like inspired at that moment to like lash out and to drop these really heavy handed hints about how they've kissed before as they're rehearsing the scene and perhaps if the writers hadn't met hadn't made Dean so like thick-headed he would understand these hints but maybe he doesn't I don't know (laughs) but like I feel like we clearly we I mean obviously we know but it's a very awkward scene to watch because Dean is just lurking over (laughs) yeah he's just glowering in the background like tall in a dark jacket just looking grumpy (laughs) and Mm -hmm. one of the hints I thought was clever I'll give that to Tristan he says um something about how this isn't their first kiss what or what about their first kiss at the party and then he follows it up with the capulets party i think Mm -hmm. it's the capulets Mm -hmm. um and so yeah he's clearly walking the line there um but rory finally asks dean to leave which he shouldn't have been there to begin with but yeah um she talks him into it, says that, like, there's no way that they can focus with him there because Tristan's just going to keep peacocking this whole time. And she's going to be uncomfortable, so it's it's not going to end. Finally, he leaves, and then Tristan comes up to her and starts to kind of lord it over her again that um, Dean is being really possessive kind of and that she and Tristan kissed kind of reminding him as reminding her as if she could have forgotten and then he leaves he just gets a page or something and bolts out of there I loved the what Paris running after him screaming into the darkness (laughs) about their rehearsal being ruined but god this scene just painful we can move on to something less painful than perhaps <laughs> like the next day is the day of the performance. Uh, we're at Luke's yet again with Suki and Lorelai having a meal. And this conversation has my Rory's bookshelf in it. As you mentioned, there are a lot of different Shakespeare references throughout the episode. Uh, and this is one of them. Suki is like excited about the show. She's talking about, oh, you know, Shakespeare Romeo and Juliet, how exciting. And she starts the like classic quote, I feel like everyone does, you know, of like, oh, Romeo, oh, Romeo, where art thou, whatever. And like she does, oh, Romeo, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's all the Shakespeare I know. <laughs> and I just, I thought that was so funny um, that she's like, she's referencing it, but she doesn't really know the line and aligned with what we we're kind of joking about, like, all the iambic pentameter all of this like Shakespeare stuff can be a little like inaccessible to 
um a lot of us like it's just difficult and I feel like also it, sometimes it feels so overrated um but also it's cool and creative too like it has good parts as well so I just thought this was really funny like I liked Suki's excitement but then I also liked the whole like doesn't know the line at all past the oh Romeo part yeah I love Suki in this scene she's also wearing something that almost got my Lorelai's closet which is a cozy green cardigan just Mm. an episode for green (laughs) (laughs) yeah what happens next is my stars hollow moment for the episode so people are still teasing Lorelai about dating a young guy Miss Patty walks by and just kind of like says Lorelai and gives her a knowing look yeah you naughty naughty girl (laughs) she says (laughs) and Lorelai is asking like how did everybody know was it Suki who said um but Kirk snapped pictures and the town just likes to tease her um yeah I I love this because it just it does show how close-knit they are and like even though it's kind of you know, maybe stepping over a boundary. It's more like tiptoeing over a boundary and like dancing back. So it's just like fun, poking fun at her. Mm -hmm. Um, The only person who's taking it seriously is Luke. Of course. Yeah. Because he is, you know, jealous that she's dating. If she started to date again, uh, if she's starting to date again, it's not him. And that's like, how could she? But that will be a conversation shared at a later point as well this brings us to the final like performance night and to your point about like all the different creative options groups could have taken it seems like all the other groups did interesting things even if they're not somewhere more successful than others perhaps like the first one we see is a bunch (laughs) of like uh, people living in the like they're like cave people or something (laughs) the stereotypical kind of um which is different I suppose uh the one that Henry is in they're all wearing like business suits which I think is really cool and I actually imagine like that could be like two different companies feuding or like or having to merge or something like that like I thought that was a fun contemporary spin and it goes with the whole like masculine egos I think of businessmen go well with the whole like masculine vibes of the people fighting in Romeo and Juliet um and lane is like watching with a really flirty and proud (laughs) face as henry is speaking his lines which i thought was this like small but cute moment between them yeah i will i think uh henry was dying and lane was just like looking over him batting her eyes it was adorable (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. um but during this we kind of see that not all is going well in the final scene Mm -hmm. um so Rory is all dressed up, looking very Elizabethan, and Paris comes, and she's freaking out because Tristan isn't there. Who's surprised, to be honest? (laughs) And um, Rory suggests that they split up and look at all the bathrooms to see if he's smoking in there. Paris speed walks away, which I just thought was a great visual. (laughs) She doesn't run. She speed walks um, with her hair, like, swishing behind her. Um, But he finally shows up, and he's not in costume or anything, and he talks just to Rory in Paris and says that he has been pulled out of school. His dad has pulled him out of school. Paris disappears in a humph. We don't really know what she's doing yet. (laughs) But (laughs) then Rory attempts again to check in on him like they're great friends or something, and uh Tristan explains that he had been trying to break into one of his friend's dad's safe which I'm pretty sure is one of the plot lines of Edward Scissorhands they have Edward help them break into a friend's house to get the safe (laughs) but anyways um so his dad has pulled him out and is sending him to military school um Rory tries to be all understanding and like tries to give him solutions, like, just apologize and you can come back and behave better. Dean, meanwhile, also is standing at the edge of the crowd watching them. I'm just glad that Tristan is gone after this. He leaves. He doesn't... He says that he wishes he could kiss her, but Dean is watching, which was just like, just go. Just get out of here, please. (laughs) Um, But yeah, he's gone. Yeah. 
Good riddance. <laughs> um, I liked that there was a line um, where Roy's like, who some either of them says like, was he doing this because he was going through something? And Tristan says, yeah, I was. I was going through the safe. <laughs> and I like this is included because sometimes it's like, oh, there's something deep that's causing them to do bad things. But it's like, no, there's nothing deep about this. He's just like a teenage rebellious dude who's a dick and he was doing something wrong and he got caught and that's just all there was to it, really. There's not some big backstory here, uh, though like he takes his dad off is what he says and you see his dad in the hallway looking really foreboding about to take him to military school, so... There's a potential backstory there, of course, but, like, I'm glad that they didn't really make much room for that. Um, But as you described, like, that final moment between the two of them is my Friday night dinner critique. Um, I think we've said a whole lot about this so far, but I would just say, like, uh, what I don't think was well done is that they give Rory and Tristan this moment of, like, take care of yourself, Mary, he says, and she smiles and, like, looks fondly at him, like, maybe I would let you kiss me right now if Dean wasn't here. Um, Like, I don't think they should have this, like, sweet, happy send-off of him. Like, it's some romantic thing, and maybe he'll come back next year and they'll date or something like that. It's, like, not the note I want them to end on, not how I want the story to be wrapped up. Um, And I still see, like, TikToks and edits of Tristan and stuff as like this like romantic desirable guy and it's so sad that they could never date and I just could not disagree more Mm -hmm. you know like and I think part of that is this like the show's wishy-washy treatment of him and his like his characterization I feel like they really fumble the ball with it and this moment is a huge one of I've seen this like goodbye before of like take care Mary and it's like the fact that it ends with the Mary, which was the very thing, I, it's not this cutesy bookend thing they think it is. No. I've talked about the nickname before, not much else to say. It's just so sexist and rude. And the fact that they have, they write it in and direct Alexis Spadell to smile at this is just so gross to me. And I, I don't approve. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree 100%. And as you were talking, I was thinking of the other bad boy that we have and kind of like, the different um, levels to which their badness goes, I guess. Mm-hmm. Tristan is portrayed as desirable. Jess is also portrayed as desirable, but not... Like, Tristan is desirable for everybody. <laughs> Jess is desirable only for Rory and the audience. Nobody else likes mm-hmm. him. But Tristan is the one who's willing to actually go and do something harmful to people like break into their house and steal their money whereas Mm -hmm. Jess on the other hand draws a chalk outline in front of doses and (laughs) strings up caution tape like there's such a huge difference between what they do and how also how they're received it's just amazing yeah and Jess is like mischievous you Mm -hmm. know like mischief managed yeah like it's not the same it's not like a crime like you're saying or like yeah I agree I think there are important distinctions that make why we find just still like desirable and like a good character in the end compared to Tristan and Mm -hmm. if we need to have this debate more I'm I'm happy to defend (laughs) just till the end of the time (laughs) compared to Tristan on this on this note and just is never like rude to Rory I either that's yeah. another thing too like the way Jess treats Rory like he admires her for her qualities whereas Tristan makes fun of them by calling her Mary you know and I talked about that before like the difference between Ace versus Mary for nicknames as well I think like we don't don't want to get too much into that but like there's so many so many reasons we could account <laughs> after all this time still of like what makes Tristan a horrible person mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess we could move on to my gazebo mm-hmm. moment. This is my gazebo <laughs> moment. It's oh, so good. I think this is like, we keep doing this, but <laughs> it's not our fault they put in such wonderful yeah. scenes. <laughs> Paris bursts in. She is dressed as Romeo now. 
what are you standing for? Let's go. (laughs) We get the final scene with Paris very dramatically reading out the lines. I was a little bit disappointed that they didn't actually kiss. Yeah. But I'm guessing that was some network thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it was just like so perfect. Paris, she is committed to the very end. Um, She will not only direct, but she'll play a starring role. She's one of those people. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. I loved the like the physical comedy of her running down the hallway wearing the Romeo costume out of nowhere to like break up this like emotional scene. And then the like intense line readings of (laughs) Romeo's lines. So good. So comedic. And just like her ultimate commitment, her preparation for anything that comes her way is so good and the only slight thing that disappointed me as well is the fact that they shied away from including the kiss i also think it was probably them being afraid or having some note from the kind of network thing but it's like to like the fact that they're afraid to show two girls kissing when it's not even a romantic scene is a little embarrassing i think for them but times were different i suppose <laughs> paris would have paris would have gone for it in fact I'm pretty sure when they are in college and go on spring break, doesn't Paris kiss Rory? Yeah. She would have gone for it. Like, that was definitely not not a writer's choice for Paris. <laughs> I was actually just looking at the spring break episode and just thinking in general of being on TikTok, you get, there's a lot of TikToks for shipping Paris and Rory, which I totally approve of. I think my, like, headcanon of them is more so in the friends territory, but I totally enjoy and like res- respect and support the Paris and Rory like romantic side of things as well. So I think this is like a notable scene for that too. Like if you would like queer readings of their relationship, this is a good one. And it would just be even better for that reading if they had actually shared a kiss. Um, and like later on, um, as they're talking about the performance, Dean asks her, did you really kiss or was it a Mm -hmm. stage thing? So they're implying in the story that they did kiss when they didn't really. But also Dean is doing that like sexist thing of being like, oh, so hot that two girls kiss in front of me. And Rory says a lady never kisses and tells. So like it's treated weirdly, this kiss, like pretending it happened, including a weird approach to it, but not actually having it. But I don't know. It doesn't really dampen the gazebo moment too much for me. Yeah. (laughs) And we, after the play is all done, Suki feels smarter, which I thought was important to note. Um, (laughs) But Lorelai, we get another perfect friendship moment between the two of them. Mm Lorelai is ranting about how Luke has been pretty mean to her about this younger guy thing, which... Like, he runs so hot and cold. Yeah. (laughs) And... Suki, she's said this before, like she has told Lorelai straight up before, how can Lorelai not see that Luke is obviously in love with her and Mm -hmm. Luke is upset because now he feels like Lorelai will date anybody, even a young guy, (laughs) like some Mm -hmm. kid straight out of college before he would, she would date him. Lorelai kind of still refuses to see it in that way, but Suki like, she's always just speaking the truth. <laughs> she knows. She observes people. I wonder if as Suki is having this conversation, if she's thinking, like, how many more goddamn times yeah. am I going to have to make this same point? Yeah. And it's like, this was not your last one, Suki. I'm so sorry no. to say. You got two more seasons of it. <laughs> yeah. The part of me does wonder if Lorelai takes at least a little bit of this in from the conversation that she starts with Luke in the last scene of the episode, which is essentially getting at the idea of her saying dating is hard. Like, are you good at it? I'm not good at it. Um, I Part of the struggle of dating for her is finding someone she thinks will be in her life forever and then finding out that's not the case with the whole Max thing. So she kind of lists like, There's Suki and Rory at the town and you of like people who I want in my life, essentially getting at the idea of like, I don't want to date you potentially and ruin the, like ruin the, ruin having you in my life. Um, And he seems to like 
she doesn't say that in so many words, of course, but it's like it's hinted at. And he kind of gets this and smiles again. He's his kind of coldness goes away and he's like, oh, tell me about Romeo and Juliet. So we get the sense that there's been a bit of resolution, some things communicated that were not said. And maybe you're left wondering, like, will they date down the line, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bit ambiguous, but still like sweet. And they kind of go back to their easygoing relationship. Yeah, I loved this. It reminded me also that Lorelai is a Taurus and (laughs) Tauruses famously like things to stay the same. They like consistency and like predictability and this really speaks to that, I think. And yeah, it was a touching moment. I definitely see where Lorelai is coming from. Like their friendship is so good, you know, it would be a huge wild card to start dating all of a sudden yet another like tales all this time sort of conflict in terms of relationships like we had the we're on a break and we have the we're (laughs) friends i don't know if we should date like we got some good tropes going on here Mm -hmm. that's true Uh, that's that was a great episode i think Mm -hmm. i mean we we obviously had some cringe moments but i feel like we had a lot to talk about absolutely season yeah. two has had some really gems so far mm-hmm. and i know i'm yeah we have the brace bridge dinner which oh, you have named my as one of your it is your favorite <laughs> so i look forward to talking about um a very wintry episode in the like middle of summer yeah <laughs> god i wish <laughs> oh, it's gonna be good yeah i'm at the point of summer and just so our listeners know it's literally may 31st but i am saying i'm at the point <laughs> of summer where i'm like you know, I could do fall. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. So the last thing to say is to, of course, request that you like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Consider leaving us a review. Uh, find us on Instagram and TikTok if you'd like to get even more content from us. And also, as we kind of near the midpoint, we'll probably do another midway recap and think about you know, reflect on the first half. So if you have any gazebo moments, we might have time to share some of those um, to, so you can send those to our email at talkingfastpodcasts at gmail.com. And we look forward to hearing from you. Um, so yeah. let's talk about winter next week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>